Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 159 of the Beat the Farmers podcast with me, Ben Eagle. Now, there is a, a lot to cover on today's show with my guest. Um, he is he's done a lot. He does a lot. And he's been on a bit of a regenerative farming journey uh, for quite some time now. So I know a lot of listeners, um, you will be interested in hearing about his story and what he's learned so far. So definitely want to focus on that today. Stephen Ware um, from Throne Farm in Herefordshire is on the show. Um, Stephen had a career at several big companies in the food sector before returning to his family's 320 acre farm in 2001. He expanded the business, particularly the commercial apple and pear orchards. But following a Nuffield scholarship and particularly a trip to Australia, um, he flipped his approach on its head and began focusing on regenerative principles. This is largely due in part, at least, to excess phosphorus in his soils. And we'll, of course, talk today also, following on from last week, about the River Y situation, um, which we were engaging with Sarah James about. Please go back and listen to that episode if you haven't already. So his business is now mixed and, and includes some very interesting enterprises, including insects. Um, yes, you did hear that right, listeners. Um, and they were recognised for all of this last year as a finalist in the BBC's Food and Farming Awards. Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. How are you doing? Thanks, Ben. I think you've covered it all. Shall we? Uh, shall I was going to say, that's it. <laughs> Easy edit. That's it for today. <laughs> Perhaps I should say that the Nuffield Scholarship was a means to an end. I'd already sort of embarked on a few ideas and uh, yeah. I very much geared it around to uh, things that I thought would help um, in my outlook on the farm. Okay. No, definitely looking delving into that. So um, tell us about your part of Herefordshire, first of all. It's the northwest corner of Herefordshire. So uh, the nice thing is we have got great views of the Black Mountains, uh, Hay Bluff Escarpment uh, to the west and to the north is the Radnor Hills. Um, but we're in a little bit of a rain shadow here with some good soils um, and some gorgeous scenery. Yeah. And, uh, and, the, and the farming picture locally? Mixed. Um, you can grow about anything in Herefordshire because of that reason. Yeah, no, it is, it is a great part of the world. Give us some um, give us some history of the farm because your grandfather, I think, bought the farm in, in the 40s um, and you've been there ever since. Um, so what have been the changes since then? Well, if, if you want the history before that, it's called Throne Farm because King Charles I stayed here when he was on a run from Cromwell. Oh, I like probably, that story. Probably That's enjoyed good. drinking the perry and the cider that we made on the farm, <laughs> uh, which was then sold in the farmhouse. Which has got, uh, which was a coaching inn, and uh, I remember playing hide and seek in the uh, in the priest hole that they had there, and, and behind the grandfather clock, you know. Oh, fantastic! Those, yeah, great things. Um, then there's a diary, uh, diary of Thomas Bull, which is in the uh, local museum that chronicles the history of the farm through the repeal of the Corn Laws and all that uh, potato blight. Um, so it's fascinating history there. Um, bring that up to date. The grandfather came in. Um, obviously the uh, a dig for victory initiative through the war post-war um drained some of the meadows down the uh the bottom of the farm and uh, it was a very mixed farm um and my father carried that tradition on um but we ended up turn of the century with uh poultry and uh um, just planted uh, some intensive cider apple orchards um and um and some wheat and that was about it yeah yeah and then bringing us can you bring us right up to date because quite recently there have been quite a few changes haven't there yeah, <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, so bringing it up to date, we, you, you, so looking at um, sort of growth metrics, so if you look at, we, you know, I used to have a website that said I could fill, I don't know, 50 swimming pools, Olympic sized swimming pools with my apples, I could grow more chickens to stretch between here and Scotland. It was all about scale and volume, and I suppose that's the best way to encompass what the changes have been, is, is just a different outlook. So um, I think I was the first person on the uh, Goldman Sachs um, business development course to have a growth metric of increasing organic matter as one of my growth metrics. Okay. Uh, and so we've diversified. I uh, used the word already, extensive. I, I, it actually doesn't mean anything, but... Uh, We've extensified the business. I, I sort of think of it as the opposite of intensive, um, but uh, we um, we've changed from broiler growing to pullets, uh, which is a li little less. Um, you, you don't have to just get the birds over the line to slaughter. Um, you want to produce a bird that's got a longer life span, and uh, and and so it's a bit less less. You push them less. Um, similarly, 
in the orchards, uh, less intensive. Uh, I planted a lot of trees. I think you're going to talk about that later, but they were on an M9 rootstock, and that's very pretty much in this climate um, for them on life support. So uh, mm. um, we've gone for a, a more extensive approach on that um, in an agroforestry system, which again we'll we'll discuss later. Yeah, and just briefly, let's pause on that sort of I suppose shifting of thinking. Um, why? What were there sort of set causes, set reasons why you began to shift your thinking of where you're heading? I think probably a risk-based analysis of the business. And uh, if you've got a big commitment to one customer, it doesn't work for everyone. And this is, this is the, uh, I've got to wear caution on this advice because it doesn't work for everyone. You either yeah. develop a market. It's a big advantage is if you've got a big, one big customer, you've got one big market, you know what you're doing. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, more of a sound business. Um, but I tended to want to have the other opposite effect was reduce my risk uh, and be a bit more fleet of foot and seeing, seeing really what smaller, more extensive opportunities there might be. Mm. That's, mm. that's the sort of uh, theme of it, but uh, without being too specific. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, the fruit tree planting um, and you planted around 50,000 new trees since, since 2007. Um, how have those done commercially since then? <laughs> Very mixed. I mentioned about discovering an M9 rootstock is, a, is like a dwarf rootstock. What that does, it filters the amount of uh, nutrition and therefore controls the amount of growth that goes through the roots up into the tree. And uh, it, it, it does mean the trees are less uh, resistant to disease and pests. And so um, that's really um, not such a good decision on, uh, on the tree planting. Um, Plus, when you plant an orchard, you can't be half pregnant, and the, the cider market is quite whimsical. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of uh, moves towards this um, sweet, sickly, I'm bound to say that, um, <laughs> fruit in cider. Um, and that's meant a bittersweet market for uh, apples, which was our saviour in, in so much as you couldn't source bittersweet fruit from around the globe. You can now source apples or apple concentrate from anywhere. So um, there's been an awful lot of change in land use in Herefordshire, particularly with cider orchards. Um, being grubbed up okay i mean can we dig a bit more into that because we, we we barely mention um cider on the show which uh apart okay. from apart from our, our local pub has a cider festival on at the moment and i my, my my brain is i would say is in a much worse state because of it this week <laughs> <laughs> but can you uh, can, can you just give us, a, anything. <laughs> <laughs> give us give us an overview of the cider market and how's it doing now poorly uh, obviously you had the covid situation um, but on top of that, the, the, the trends um, of consumption um, towards more sweet um, ciders and, and fruit additions. So, yeah, for, for, for Herefordshire, it's been a, a bad, a bad thing. Um, and if you look at the, which, which again, we'll, we'll touch on later, I think, but um, look at the land use between 2016 and 2020. Um, there's a large switch from permanent cropping to arable um, Yep. This feeds into the issues we'll discuss on the river wide, but uh, one of the big drivers there is is, is the grabbing up of orchards. Mm -hmm. So I've actually been doing that, but uh, I've been terming it um, not ripping out trees. It's more a case of reconfiguring my orchard into an agroforestry system. I, I think that sounds a little bit okay. softer on the palate, but uh, <laughs> the reality is, yeah, we we've been taking taking orchards out and making them into a, a less intensive system uh, where we've got less trees so um, more air and light around each tree um, we need less chemical inputs to keep it going we've lifted the crown which means that the top the bottom meter and a half we've taken all the branches away there so there's airflow underneath um, but it also means mechanical um, solution to our hand picking um, okay. at the moment um, most cider um, producers actually shake the tree and yep. the, the apples fall onto the soil um, but as we all know with soil, soil is a, a, an organ which breaks things down. And so if you've got apples on the floor, obviously they're going to start breaking down. So you get the rots and the quality isn't there. So we, we're trying to reshift, just, just reshift the emphasis a bit on, on the whole thing so that we can supply craft cider makers okay. who appreciate the quality. Let's talk a bit about you and your sort of journey to where you are now. So uh, going back a bit, you studied agriculture at Newcastle. Um, Take us back to that time. Could I take you back a bit further? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> My schooling. Uh, I wasn't particularly 
keen on the academic side of things, but perhaps where I excelled was um, things like captaincy on the rugby field, you know, captain of three teams consecutively, three age groups. Yeah. Uh, and those sort of carried over into my university career, I would say. I, I sort of, it was a great place to discover myself. Um, I'd say I sort of realised I was quite an activist, you know, I enjoyed um, problem solving and, and um, you know, I do a lot of swimming and cycling now. Um, pretty independent as well. Um, so I didn't really, I didn't really know it at the time, but subsequently I wouldn't really fit into a formal business um, situation particularly well. I, I could excel in it, but I didn't really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, and I suppose that's the same if you work for yourself in most anything. And, and the academic side, I mean, I'm, I like to think I'm pretty straightforward and, and I'm really keen on tacit knowledge. I mean, you yeah. don't go into farming um, it, it, as a rational business decision. Uh, <laughs> you do it for a that's, challenge. That's true enough. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, a good example would be my dissertation where it was about russet Burbank potatoes, which were developed in the 19th century. Um, and McDonald's had a demand for them because they were rectangular and they made good chip, good fries they call them. Um, but that really didn't resonate with the uh, with the academia um, situation because all they wanted was you, you to plagiarise. I don't know about half a dozen. Um, you're only worthy to plagiarise half a dozen reports from uh, <laughs> PhD students and and uh, regurgitate that. So you know, whereas it's something practical that I could see had an application. It got me some work after after college. Yep. But uh, it, it didn't really fit with me. So uh, uh, brilliant time, great university. Wouldn't, wouldn't discourage anyone from going there. But, uh, but for me, the academic side wasn't really the, 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 big, the big part of it. Okay. And where did you go directly after that? Yorkshire. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I started working my way south. I was going to say, gradually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well... Yeah, nobody really heard of Newcastle other than in Hereford, other than beating them in the FA Cup in 1972. <laughs> it's about the only thing we've got to be proud of uh, in a sporting sense. Uh, Yorkshire was RHM ingredients, and they were a food vector, um, a food ingredient vector. So they, they supplied all sorts of uh, rusk, breadcrumbs, okay. seasonings to all sorts of companies. So it was a great start in the, um, in the food industry. Um, then I ended up in uh, uh, United Biscuits making sandwiches. Um, that was pretty interesting. On a senior team, mid twenties, turnover more than um, wow. more than uh, Manchester United. Wow. Yeah, yeah, just right wow. place, right time. You know, they got in with Mark Spencer's. It really took off. Um, got promoted within them, but in the in having a promotion, it's a long story. But the the job that I promoted to didn't exist, and so that was it for me. I I, I thought well. Uh, they don't really value people here too much. And so, uh, uh, yeah, we, we moved on. I, I, I ended up, uh, after redundancy, a mile down the road working for Whitbread, which was a better okay. job, better pay. <laughs> so, yes, another, uh, yeah, these things just come along. But you, yeah. you, you've got to put yourself in uncomfortable positions, I think. And, and that's paid off for me time and time again because um, I, I can cope with it. But, it, I, you know, it is... The only way, I, the best way for me to learn and to yeah. find experiences. And, I think that's uh, such a good very point. Much a good pattern of my career. Yeah, yeah. We don't grow unless we put ourselves in those sort of those sort of places. Take a bit of a sidestep. This is a yeah. bit random, but I mean, you gained a, a commercial helicopter license. Oh well, that was putting myself at, in my at next that time. uncomfortable position. Yeah, I suppose it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, um, why? Why? I wanted a transferable skill. Okay. I. I become disillusioned um, within the business thing. I was talking to the head office at Whitbread, but I was only any good where I was in the senior team. Um, and uh, I thought I wanted a transferable skill and people thought I was mad. You know, I think I sold my car, sold my house. <laughs> I, gained, I, I, I proposed to my wife. <laughs> <in Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but he must be loaded. He owns a helicopter. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She said All yes. Right. So. Poor little two-seater helicopter with the money and uh, went off and uh, started flying. It was it was a great thing to do. It was fantastic. Um, but uh, the skills I picked up there would be very much on the um, communication was a massive skill. Okay. Um, 
you know, if you're sat next to the, so I became an instructor and uh, it's, it's kind of a rich man's hobby. Okay. And I'd be sat next to the, well, I'll give you an example, the managing director of Dell Computers or the, one of the directors of Amazon UK. Wow. And you'd be screaming towards the ground with your engine disengaged at uh, 2,000 feet per minute. And you've got, I don't know, 20 seconds to react. And you've got to land the thing without his engine on. And uh, um, you're trying to teach them to do this. Um, you soon learn how to communicate. Um, so you had a special relationship with these people. And you'd phone up the... Um, uh, their, their office to speak to them and you get you know, speak to their PA and they're like rock violers but as soon as they say your name it's oh, we'll, we'll put you straight through kind of thing so that is that fascinating communication okay oh yeah if you're flying Silverstone and you've got I don't know one movement every 20 seconds it's it's apparently Vietnam's the only helicopter maneuver um situation that's been more intense than Silverstone used to be before they built it up and developed it so that yeah again you had to communicate there you had six channels you're working on the uh, on the RT radio box and then uh, it was the open culture of aviation um, if you make a mistake you own up to it you discuss it so that somebody else won't make that mistake and um, that's a really important aspect that we can learn from and that yeah. resonates on my farm with my with my crew yeah now, a bit I like, say, a bit like say being at Groundswell last week, actually. What's that there? <laughs> well, as, a, as a culture of just opening up, opening up yes. about your mistakes. Oh, yeah, 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 it is. It is. It's, it's, it's like I sit down and it's, it's, oh, God, see, I've, I've, I've reversed something into this or I've broken that. It's like, well, did you set out to do it? No. Were you being reckless? No. Right. Well, let's talk about it and see how we won't do it again. You know, yeah. there's no point getting upset about it. You do get individuals that are reckless, but... Um, if you've got an open culture, they feel less pressure, there's less red mist, and you just get on with it. Um, because that's a big frustration in farming, isn't it? Um, machinery and uh, stuff. And, you know, you learn that machinery is there to be respected. Um, and, you know, especially a helicopter where your life sort of depends on it, you know, the servicing is so important and uh, operating of it and recording of it is so important um, and looking after it. But you, you do learn that you always take the engineer with you that's done all the work on it for its first test flight after a full service that's uh, that's one tip <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's if anyone out there is considering that yeah <laughs> so um so so when your daughter lauren was born um and your wife mandy you beat me you decided that you'd move to the family farm in herefordshire i mean that was big lifestyle change was i mean was that was, was that sort of the was that the thing that shifted it or was there were there other things going on as well I got a job uh, in uh, Norwich with Sterling Helicopters, which is where uh, oh, wow. Prince William ended up. And uh, of course, they introduced a new law. They had to wear a head helmet, and um, I just didn't fit in a helicopter. But uh, helicopters, I'm tall. You see, I'm six foot four, <laughs> four, four foot twenty eight. Oh, are you right? And and so that was a kind of turning point where I thought well I can't I'm just going to jig on my back if I've got to wear a helmet like, there's nothing you can't adjust the seats you've got to go to the Civil Aviation Authority and develop a new seat that's probably 100,000 pounds to do that I don't know so wow uh, that was a big yeah. driver in it so I looked at other aircraft and getting ratings on those and um, so I looked it was around the time of 9-11 and I looked at um, going into airlines I thought well I can sit a computer at home and do something uh, I was a sort of little in a way a glorified taxi driver and I'd done I'd done it all and and um, you know flown into some of the best places in the world to fly into in a helicopter and I thought well actually I'll go home I continued doing it um, at Gloucester Saverton um, two days a week and my father was running running the farm with him the rest of the time so it was it was kind of like a phased in approach but it, it did give us an opportunity to um, move away from the southeast and move somewhere and do something perhaps a little bit more um, meaningful than uh, punching holes in the sky and uh, you know, sort of playing a hoolie. Fascinating. So what about those first sort of couple of years back on the place? Um, what was that like? Oh, it was quite an adjustment. Yeah. Um, we sort of consolidated, really, a period of consolidation. I'd always, like I say, I'd always had that, that, those, I didn't never had a, a formal plan, but always had something on the go. Um, and it was probably as much a challenge to get the family um, sort of settled in over here. Yeah. And it's, it's an important fact if anyone's considering moving back to the farm. Um, 
uh, you've got to respect your partner or wife, husband, whoever. And <laughs> Mandy, she, lo- she loves my dad, but she didn't want to be known as Mike Ware's daughter-in-law because yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of a stifling environment in Herefordshire and um, you've got to find your way in. So it was important not to just do the normal thing and oh, we'll move on to the farm. And and uh, so we, we moved a couple of parishes away, which is a, which is an eternity in Herefordshire terms. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you like foreigners. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so, things like that. But also, I mean, the business was really successful and... Um, you know, we, we, we developed it and built on it. And um, when your back isn't against the wall, perhaps you're not looking so much to new uh, things. You just want to um, optimise what you have. Yeah. So it's a good position to be in, dare I say. Mm. Um, mm. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead to your Nuffield scholarship now. But as you mentioned earlier, um, this was part, your Nuffield was almost part, it was quite far along down the process um but you did your enough field scholarship in 2011 your subject was remaining competitive in the top fruit industry i mean i think because you were in you must have been in stephen briggs's uh tom bradshaw tim may he must have been in your cohort yeah well. they were all that was our cohort yeah we had yeah. a good, good group i think if carlsberg had to invent a group you'd <laughs> use that one yeah uh, as the ab- advertising parlance goes <laughs> yeah it was it was it was excellent it was another one of those things where you put yourself into another place. I mean, if you think about the helicopters, I, I, I went from being a senior, pretty senior manager in a, in a big multinational with a secure job and everything back to becoming the most junior pilot in, in Virgin, Virgin Air, Airlines, you know, kind of thing. And it, it is a similar thing, really, isn't it? At the age I was at, I didn't need to go and do it. But actually, I met some of the most um, stimulating company um, people on, on the not just the cohort but also on my way around um and you know i had a i had a bit of an agenda i didn't want to do a, a, a big report i mean i think one of the, I, I do have criticisms on that field and i know people roll their eyes when they when they hear about it and i do to some extent and that everyone comes back and they're full of enthusiasm and <laughs> invigorated but you just in danger of repeating what you've seen, which might work in New Zealand, it might work somewhere else, but unless you come back and test it and, and yeah. everything, it won't, you don't even know whether it's going to work on your farm, let alone anyone else's. So uh, I think there's a bedding in period that you need. And this is where I talk again about tacit knowledge. It, it, it's the same with renewable farming. You, you, you've got to try these things because no one there to support you. Um, you're putting an un- yourself in an uncomfortable place. You know, we've been simmering away since 2007 on what you'd call regenerative farming. Um, but when you're out there, you do you do feel pretty alone and, and stuff because there's no support or training from the government. So the good thing about the Nuffield was you could, could go out and see these places where they are trying things. And, and um, you know, the Australians are very, very resilient. And that really helped me in 2005, 15, when I had a big major issue on the farm. Okay. Um, financial um, issue. Uh, I put myself in uncomfortable places again. Uh, I'm repeating that. That's one of the key themes mm. for mm. this. Um, you know, I went to China. I didn't speak a word of Mandarin. Um, I landed there. They, they, they basically, it's all about face in there. In terms of, um, there was a, a show. As soon as the um, big wigs disappeared from the show, which was on the first day. It just became a giant car boot sale. I was in China for a week and they were supposed to be looking after me, but they just buggered off back to Beijing. So <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Oh, I, I went to look at some pandas in Chengdu. I mean, there's uh, 15 million people in Chengdu. I mean, I never even heard of it, this place. <laughs> and um, I'd met one lady at the show who spoke English who helped me negotiate to get some samples from a, a, a Taiwanese company, I think. Uh, anyway, the following day, the, 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 the people who were supposed to be looking after me disappeared. And so I, I, I thought, well, after I've been to see the pandas, there's not much else to do. I, um, um, I, I realised I was uh, the capital of the Shizuan province in Chengdu. So I marched up to the uh, up to the government building there almost, and they're changing the cars. They're all armed to the teeth. And I come up and say, oh, I'm from England. I'm doing this. And just, just blurting out English. And eventually a phone got shoved in my face. And, uh, and so the voice on the other end says, uh, do you have a problem? I said, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your people are supposed to be looking after me and they've all buggered off back to Beijing. Oh, 
Oh, right, okay. Can you hand the phone back to the lady with you? And she scribbled down something on the, on a piece of paper. They shoved me in a taxi, and I disappeared across Chengdu. And uh, so I'm walking up this, I get bundled out of the taxi, he points vaguely at this building. I've got a piece of paper, man. I don't know what I'm going to do, what it is. And I'm halfway up the street, and then I get a tap on the shoulder. This lady says, hello, do you remember me from yesterday? It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? I'd had a conversation with, yeah. And she said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I've, I just gave her the piece of paper. Oh, you've come to see my boss, she said. Oh. And that was it. And, and he thought it was brilliant because it was their opportunity to um, get back at the authorities in Beijing. So they, they, yeah, they of course. Within, within hours, I had, I had, a, tax, I had a, a driver, a translator, the local agricultural guy and, and um, somebody else. And well, what do you want to do, you know? But until you put yourself in that position, you don't get these opportunities. And uh, um, I, I still, it still took me three hours to get to a meeting five minutes in the hotel, but that's another whole story. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of Nuffield. I went to China, South America, but also I fitted in, like I said, um, the sustainable ag course in Australia. In Australia. Graham States, yeah, support over to the UK in 2014 um, because I, I thought it really did... Um, do a, a really fantastic, fantastic course. I, would, I think um, people might recognise that Tom Bradshaw was on that course with me. I, mm -hmm. um, he's an NFU vice something or other president or chair. I don't know what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Been very successful. Mm -hmm. But just uh, like sat outside on a trading estate in um, in northern Australia somewhere and and uh, Queensland, and uh, Tom walks around and goes, "Oh, Tom, what are you doing here?" Oh, well. No, he said to me, I think it's the other way around. What, what are you doing? What? Come to the course, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know we were going to meet there. So. Uh, that's bizarre. So it says a practical application back to your farm, like we were saying earlier. Uh, what did you take away and what did you make any changes or were you already, because you were already on that path? So yeah, what yeah. changed? The, the, the light bulb moment, well, there are two, two light bulb moments I talk about. One is uh, the phosphorus issue in 2007. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get too detailed about it, so we'll skip over that for the purpose of this yep. um, podcast. But um, the second one was, um, imagine a row of trees, and beneath the trees you have a, like a strip of soil, um, because in the um, cider world, harvesting was done off the floor, so you didn't want grass underneath the trees because it disrupted the harvest process. Yep. And our customer used to quaintly call that the sterile strip. Okay. And it occurred to me on a, a, a on a farm visit once that somebody's going to ask a question one day, probably a smart ass uh, professional who trades in words that I'm very disparaging about, would <laughs> ask the question, well, why are you trying to grow trees in a sterile strip? And that just lodged in my head. Nobody ever asked that question, thank God. But that started me off on, on a whole tirade of soil and you know the rabbit holes you talk about. So um, I bought a, mulch, a mower with a mole show at um, that, that used to put the grass that we mowed in, in the middle between the trees, under the trees, as a mulch. And that was the start of our uh, regenerative uh, journey, I would say. Well, we've made every, it's been a roller coaster ride. We, we, you know, if you, if you said anything that's kind of regenerative related to us, we've probably done it and tried it mm. um, to various degrees of success. But what we have discovered, it has to be easy to do. Okay. Um, and it's got to fit in with your system. And so, it's getting the system right. And I know that sounds dull and boring, but that's the most important thing. There's no silver bullet. You, uh, uh, Dr. Christine Jones was over in a local farm and she was banging on about, which is quite right, that, that why, well, why are you trying to grow maize with a coating of a, a fungicide on it? And, and, you know, this is just mad. And on the way back to the cars, there was a trailer with some product on it. Everyone went, like, flies around shit on that, you know, but it's not about product, products help, but it's only part of the whole thing. And you've got yeah. to put together a system that works for you, works for your farm, but also works for, for the soil and, and the whole um, uh, nature um, side of things. Yeah. And that, that, that's the biggest point. Um, so that's the most difficult thing to get across. It's very easy to say, oh yeah, you should try humates, using humates or brew this or compost that. But no, it's, it's the system that's the most important thing. Yeah. And, and in, uh, in finding out that system, what, what hasn't worked so well? <laughs> I've got set up to everything there. <laughs> well, you did want to talk about compost later on. I, I, I struggle with making compost. I do it, but um, it's the right thing to do. But it is just such a, uh, an intensive 
um, difficult thing to do. You just need so much space and compaction. And uh, if you don't do it properly, you get weed burdens. You, yeah. Uh, and I think it's when you do things that with best of intentions. So, you know, we had an iron deficiency. So you buy iron, but then you start to antagonize other minerals. You know, you can, you can, you can get yourself too, too detailed about things. Okay. We started doing sap analysis. Um, a lot of my work was done probably regenerally on trees, but we did we did sort of pay some attention to the wheat. You'd get the results back and micromanage them, and um, in the end, you just got to resolve to have luxury levels of uh, magnesium, calcium, um, boron, and um, phosphorus if if the system allows it, uh, and then the rest have to fall into place. I mean, you get to know what's what. But if you start adding too much of one thing, it will just antagonize something else. And uh, it's a very delicate, delicate thing. So get your um, calcium, magnesium uh, right in the soils and then foliar applications uh, to, uh, uh, to to let the soil rest. And then uh, then you're away. OK, let's um, actually let's talk about compost now, because um, I think it was uh, Mike Abram actually wrote a feature in Farmers Weekly recently. Um, about composting, he visited um, Simon Cowell, which um, a lot of listeners will probably know as, as Essex farmer. Um, and in that, we're talking about. I think that there was just it's the the importance of temperature and aeration. What what is your experience with it? Very difficult to do. <laughs> <laughs> it, you're talking about tonnage, high tonnages. Um, I I've always had a bit of a thing about compost. You start with a pile. Uh, uh, let's say two meters high and by the time you finish it's 1.2 meters high so you've lost at least 35 to 40 percent of your mass so how carbon efficient is compost it's all about uh, volatilization of gases um, it's not all moisture that you've lost from the pile so you lost heat energy because it heats up and you lost carbon surely because and as in terms of carbon dioxide so what you're trying to achieve with compost is is really to stabilize whatever nutrients you have there and to apply some um, uh, biology to your to your farm and some organic matter. But you know, is it the most efficient way of, of doing it? I don't think so. I think you, if you can compost in a field effectively with uh, um, green manures and that type of thing, surely that's got to be a lot better. But if you have the resource there, which I do have in terms of where I can apply my poultry litter, yep. then it's not a bad thing. But what we, uh, the discussions I started having with um, Graham Sate, who ran the uh, sustainable ag course in all the way back in 2011. And when he came over in 2014, I said that exactly that. And uh, he, he said that there was a guy who's a good friend of his called Jerry Brunetti, and he, he'd got some what he called faculative bacteria um, that, that would. Um, um, effective microorganisms, I think they call them, um, which would uh, essentially ferment your manures and your mucks. So we're moving very much down in, in that direction to see if we can uh, um, try and secure the, the uh, nutrition and, um, and maintain that with the, the, the ammonia, not becoming ammonia in our poultry litter okay. um, and making the phosphorus. We've, it's all about, to me, it was all about phosphorus um, solubilization or, or phosphorus availability within the manures when I was making them. Um, but if we can achieve that and effectively capture the carbon and keep it there and keep everything together, um, then, uh, you know, I think that's a, a better all round system. It's not going to be the optimal system. And I, and I do agree with the composting purist that it's, it's a better product probably at the end of the day, but actually um, it's, it's a bloody nuisance to do. And it's, it's just, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think there's too much waste in the system so i think i think you know there's a best of both worlds a soil conditioner uh which is made from a manure that we can actually utilize all the nutrition within it virtually or 95 percent of it um and have those faculative bacteria now those those are bacteria that will exist either in uh, anaerobic or aerobic conditions um so what happens is when when they're in the so how technical do you want me to get there Oh no! I mean, I mean, from, from my point of view, this is fascinating. Well, yeah. Well, but if, I, to put it simply, and I, I tend to try and keep it simple, if you've got if, if you've got a 
pH below 6.5, then you're going to have less volatilization of uh, gases from any manures, uh, which is why your slurry, um, there's grounds for slurry systems with acidification um, in, in that. Um, now, what happens if you have fecurita bacteria is, is that they will um, be able to exist in an anaerobic conditions, and they do that generally by splitting um, the water, usually utilizing the oxygen from the water. Uh, and what happens with that is that you freed up the hydrogen ions. So if you've got hydrogen ions, what the free hydrogen ions are measure off with your acidity. So it tends to bring the, the, the yep. pH down within your uh, um, manure or whatever, your know, compost, whatever you want to call soil conditioner, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and so it, it's like a, a, a double benefit there to some extent. And then when you do actually go to spread it, you, you uh, well, we, we've been baling poultry manure, which is another thing we could talk about. Okay. Um, but so uh, when you come to spread it, then they spring into life um, and they've got the oxygen and they just uh, just take off. Um, so you won't have the the range you might have in a compost. You won't have the um, the fungi that you have in a compost. And we, we do spray some, something in there. So we've got some spores there of of those uh, other um, aerobic um, fungi and bacteria. Um, but you've, st you've, you've given the stimulation with some organic matter and food source to your soils when you spread it, which will then start the soil food web and ramp it into action. So uh, you're not actually adding everything you need, but, but it'll trigger the soil food web into action and uh, it'll, it'll then cycle through the bacteria, fungi, protozoa, worms and back. And the worms love it. I mean, they'll eat it. Um, they'll consume this, um, this, this, this fermented um, product very, very readily. Wow, uh, let's talk about your phosphorus story. Let's turn towards that. Because, you know, we, 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 we should mention the River Why at least once in this podcast because yeah, yeah. We, we have said we would. Um, give us some background to, to your phosphorus yeah, issues. We, we've got a major issue with the River Why, um, and I suppose the elephant in the room is is phosphorus or um, and or chicken manure. Yeah. If we take a step back, um, the, the big issue with the River Wye is the algal bloom. So yeah. it basically turns green in the summer. Uh, so phosphorus is getting a bad rap for this. And it's very easy to then become defensive about the whole thing and say, well, you know, if, if it's if it's all about agriculture and stuff, what about the water board? What, are, you know, the sewage, the 420,000 stormwater releases that we've had over the last 12 months in England and Wales. Um, what about their phosphorus stripping or lack of in the thing, grey waste, that sort of thing. Um, but the, 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 the reason why we can't uh, just, just start becoming defensive is because there's a, a new report called the Refocus Report out of Lancaster University. And the important thing to realise about that is that it's about phosphorus efficiency in the whole food system. And so it's it's but a spin-off from that that they've done a, a report on the Y catchment. Yep. So it's very much focused on the food system, all right? So what the food, what it, what that report doesn't include is uh, is uh, the um, major integrators. It doesn't mention them um, in the poultry side of things, in particular. Uh, it doesn't mention the water authorities, biosolids, um, that type of thing, and it doesn't mention anaerobic digestion. Mm -hmm. um, which uh, I, we've got some excellent farmers around here that have got AD plants that, that under sow their maize and do a really good job of it and they responsibly utilise their uh, digestate liquid and solid. Contrary to that is there are other farmers perhaps that don't actually have such a high regard for their soils. Uh, we'll rent land, it'll be autumn sown maize, autumn sown potatoes, they have to grow that as well, then they'll go into a pot of beet every time there's a fallow over winter and uh, half the soil gets washed into the river Wye, but it's not their soil because they've rented the fields. And then uh, the following spring, they go through and mother it, they dump a load of digestate on their liquid and solid and then carry on. So there, there are whole, whole um, layers to this, this whole um, argument. But the big thing uh, is that we don't know if it's phosphate. If you look at the phosphate levels on the river, and this is why your listeners should really focus and pay attention now, because mm. if you measure the river Y, the, the levels of phosphate in there are lower perhaps than the river seven and team in a lot of instances, and certainly the river Thames, but they all have their own um, issues with phosphorus. Now, whether it's more urban there, um, 
I, we don't know, but uh, certainly they, the the report from Refocus Lancaster University suggesting that uh, agriculture is responsible for 65 percent of the phosphorus in the River Y, and that uh, it's about 3,000 tonnes of phosphorus per year in the catchment, which is 417 kilometres squared. Uh, that uh, that is responsible for agriculture. So we can't stick our heads in the, in the soil, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, and ignore it. Uh, but the reality is, in, in my mind, um, phosphorus is a is the big one because I've learned since 2007 when we had a report of phosphorus indices of fours um, yeah. on our farm that it just sticks about. That's the whole thing with phosphorus. It sticks there. It's a big uh, element. It's um, basically, if it's acidic soils, it, it, it's a voracious anion. It's got three um, negative charges. What else has negative charges in the soil? Clay. So it's going to compete with that to, for, uh, for, for other minerals. So it tends to bind in acid soils to aluminium or um, uh, iron in particular. Um, and uh, if you've got al alkaline soils, then it will bind up your calcium, which is not a good thing. And it's, it's an absolute bugger to get up into your plants because I had I was finding masses or, or surplus of uh, uh, phosphorus in my soils but I was finding deficiencies in the tissue analysis as far back as 2011 okay and um, we really didn't understand it and and until you start measuring young leaves and old leaves and you appreciate that phosphorus is very mobile within the plant that, that you, re you start to get a pattern of what's going on so that's why phosphorus is a big thing but in the river why this algal bloom might be caused by nitri nitrates, um, excess nitrates. But, that, but the convenient thing about those is they, they can gas off, you know, and, and, whereas phosphorus won't, it'll just stay there. Mm. So you can't really pin that one down. It might be that it's due to the flooding, um, the flooding washing out the ranunculus weed, which tends to be a habitat for all sorts of aerobic um, sort of, uh, water life. Uh, and, and so that is for the good of the river. It also might be the temperature of the water, um, but the temperature of the water depends on flow. If we are extracting too much, then you've got less flow, therefore it tends to be a higher temperature. Um, and, uh, you know, there's all sorts of arguments. If you look at that, um, I'll kind of show you, this is really shit for, sorry, really bad for a podcast. That's <laughs> fine. Uh, I mean, we, can, we, can, picture, we can try and describe it. I want, I want to get your reaction. So that's 2016 uh, land use. Okay. Red and yellow is 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 sort of uh, arable, and green is uh, permanent. And then that's twenty twenty. No, Blimey. God. yeah. Wow. Temperature, right? But that was the right reaction I expected. Wow. Um, so, I will actually. I will, I'll. I'll try and. I don't, I don't even know how to do that, but I'll try, listeners, to actually post that in the notes. Yeah. Um, if I can. Right. That was. We've got to get uh, enough moisture in the soil. Soil moisture should be twenty five percent. Um, you can achieve that with increasing your organic matter because it's like a sponge. Um, you, then you, you've got to get your um, biology right. So, um, and this all sounds like a, like a, on roach. It sounds like I'm just repeating everything they've told you at Groundswell, but it's true. Uh, if you get your biology, you st start to get your chromium levels right for the soil porosity. That helps your air porosity. So what am I saying is... It's a huge opportunity for us to redress some of the poor agricultural um, sort of, uh, disciplines that we've uh, we've fallen out of, and we need to get them back. You, you've just seen those charts. We need to really think uh, long and hard about how the modern agricultural systems are perhaps too much of a good thing. Um, we need to really think about and focus on using manures and where we use them, um, and we need to think about well. We can use it, but actually, it might be lock, it might be detrimental to our soils and locking it up and locking up a, a lot of uh, um, things. So there's a whole raft of issues here. Yeah, uh, so I mean, because yeah. obviously last week we were looking at the Welsh side of the border on a, on a Herefordshire basis. Um, what what are some of the solutions that that you guys are proposing locally? Yeah, well, there's two things with the River Wye. One is that it's cross border, so we have different um, actually agencies involved. And the second thing is an SSSSI. So um, that means that the, the targets are that much lower than other rivers. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing because we're, we're, we're addressing the issues now. Um, but the difference across the border in terms of um, poultry manure, I mean, I did an interview for Hereford and Worcester and I said, 
on that. I said, the problem isn't necessarily in the poultry farm, it's what happens downstream of it. Now, I had to clarify myself very quickly by saying, what I meant to say was, it's, what, it's, it's the poultry manure that leaves the site that is the issue. It's not necessarily the poultry farm itself, because the majority of Herefordshire poultry farms are indoor farms, indoor yep. reared, and they have containment uh, of that manure, so it's all very controlled. Yep. But if you then deliver it to an anaerobic digestion plant, well, you're just kicking a can down the road because that phosphorus won't gas off. So whatever goes in will come out the other end and then you've got to deal with it into the form of digestate or even worse, liquid digestate. Mm. So that's our issue in Herefordshire. Whereas across the board in Wales, it would be true to say that the majority of their more recent development in poultry has been more free range. Free range. So they have, uh, and more layers, um, so they have different type of litter than the meat, meat birds, but mainly it's the ranging that's the issue there. Um, and so it, it's creating um, buffers within that system, um, like uh, uh, settling ponds at the bottom of the hill before it gets in the river, that type of thing. So we do have a, several different, different um, factors there um, compared to whales. Uh, chickens. Yeah, so you move from, I suppose this is, largely related re related to your phosphorus story as well you move from broilers to rearing pullets for, for commercial egg farms yeah. um how has that short shift um gone well we enjoy it it's a new challenge it's slightly less intensive like i said earlier yeah. in, the, in the thing it's not about getting the birds across the line to slaughter you want to, your customers to have a, a pullet a point of lay at 16 weeks old, that's ready uh, for for producing eggs for them on their farms, uh, and uh, and so yeah, it's, it's a different outlook, um, and we've enjoyed that. Yeah. What sort what sort of numbers are you up to now? I don't know. I try not to do numbers now. I'm just <laughs> holding that. Haven't you? Haven't you been listening? <laughs> yeah. You don't. I've you... Still got six sheds. <laughs> yeah, it can be up to 155,000. Yeah. I. I, I did have a moment in, in during lockdown when um, when we were doing our bit uh, completely unrecognised for the nation and feeding them. Um, and I started worked out how many eggs those pullets would go on to make in twelve to, to lay in twelve months, and I think I said yeah, how many millions? Uh, Three hundred. Uh, it was just it was just uh, yeah, it was millions of eggs. I can't yeah. even remember. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we play our part, we play our part, although we don't do it ourselves, there's some great guys out there. And, and the nice thing is our customers there are farmers, the same yep. as ourselves, they come to the farm and yep. um, we can talk about growing chickens. I don't want to particularly talk about bureaucracy or, or paperwork or anything, yeah. you know, this, this piece of paper doesn't look right, you know. Yeah. It's all about the birds and, um, and they appreciate that, I hope, mm. when they come down. Mm. Um I, just for a second, I want to highlight your farm website um, to listeners for a minute um, because I think you, what you actually do on there is you 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 present things very clearly, very concisely, um, right the way through uh, from farming year, soil diagrams, your own farming story. Um, so listeners do check that out at thronefarm.co.uk. But within that, you do mention sort of where you're going, looking to the future. Um, you have a small solar array, for example, um, decarbonizing as a project take us take us forward where you're going what's next <laughs> bailing poultry muck <laughs> yeah yeah I mean, hereford the hereford emblem is the hereford bull and uh, um we this refocus report says we're now producing more chicken muck than we are um uh, cow muck so mm -hmm. uh, we don't talk bullshit anymore now in hereford so we're talking <laughs> chicken shit <laughs> Um, that, that might have to be the title of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So seriously, um, yeah, the bailing, I've invested in a baler. Uh, it's something, it's, it's kind of a good vehicle for the message of the whole message of kind of regenerative farming and utilising, making the most of what, what we've been given. Um, and uh, and that, that, that's a really good story, uh, but it's also a, a sound um, proposition so we're going to concentrate on that um and, but, but actually i've decided i want to consolidate a bit because okay. of, you know we we've tried so many things it's just making those things work better that we know that work on our farm and so uh yeah a brewing 
getting a bit better at that, getting a bit better at application um, and just really trying to ramp that up. Um, so uh, I'm sorry if that's a bit of a, a dull answer, but um, that's what we're, you know, it's important. I think you have spurts of growth and innovation and then you just consolidate and that's what we're trying to do a little bit whilst we've got this bailing initiative going on as well. Yeah, that's fine. We can cope with dull on the show. I don't, I don't think that's dull at all. <laughs> Um, we always finish the show with the same two questions. We're going to start rounding things up. Uh, the first is, um, if you have a message for the public, Stephen, what would it be? Where do I start? Uh, <laughs> I, I'd like to, if you've listened to my um, sentiment about regenerative farming, I think it's quite similar to um, to the whole scenario with human health and. Uh, uh, you know, everything matches the calcium to magnesium ratios in the soil, match the human body, the, um, and, and it's all about biofortification. So um, it's the same with, with the whole system. And um, we've, we've learned over the last couple of years that um, uh, isn't necessarily the, the silver bullet. Well, I don't think it's the silver bullet that's going to help us. It's, I mean, it's prevention of, uh, um, of, of type 2 diabetes, of, of, uh, obesity, that type of thing. Yep. So... The, my, my overriding message is to value your food and 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 your own health, um, and to appreciate what you get, and 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 try and understand that you have got to take some responsibility for your own well-being and your own health, um, and we're here to help you. And finally, a message for farmers. Oh, this is difficult because <laughs> my situation is so difficult, so mm. different from everyone else's, and uh, it's very easy to. Uh, especially at somewhere like Groundswell, you get the evangelists there and, and you know it's all words isn't it you do need <laughs> passive knowledge and you do need to work out what works at your place mm. um, on your patch in your system in your financial constraints and everything so I, I, I really do find it difficult to lecture uh, farmers but I would say one thing cherish your natural assets and face up to your environmental responsibilities. Um, I suppose it, it would be my overriding things there. Um, you know, it's all very well saying switch to regenerative farming, but enterprises are failing um, at the moment. It's no fault of the farmers. It's the markets and the change and, and that we're in. So uh, I'd like to say on the one hand, yes, yeah, stick it, stick on it, stick stick with it. But it's very difficult if sticking with regenerative um, uh, transition if you've got other constraints and financial pressures and everything else going on. Um, so I, I would say, you know, cherish your natural assets, face up to environmental responsibilities. And uh, if you're gonna consider regeneration, just get yourself, don't go cold turkey, just get a hybrid system, find out what works, very simple thing. Glyphosate, add, add citric acid, 2.9 pH, and, uh, and a humate, and you'll use half the amount of glyphosate, that works, bang. Just, just introduce those simple things, those types of things, uh, and don't try and no, over try with it initially and, um, and work your way in. But things are changing so quickly, it's very difficult to, to actually prescribe that, anything. Yeah. Well, we'll leave it there. Um, Sorry, that wasn't very concise. Uh, but <laughs> thank, no, it's fine. Thank you. Thank you, honestly, so much, Stephen. I mean, there is a, a massive amount to unpack in this episode. Um, I, know, I know for one thing, I think when, when I go through the editing process, I'm, I'm going to be listening. Um, acutely to lots of those things uh, yeah again. we didn't really touch on the agroforestry um we didn't i mean we can go we can go back and, I, 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 and no, do more no, if you no, want no, no, but no, i think no, there's no, plenty no, in there no, anyway but yeah just to make your your uh, listeners aware um and we yeah i used to show a side of uh, a row of trees and i used to call it tunnel vision and it's like that on a farm and so the more people that visit your website and engage with you on social media and uh, we're not very good at it, but when I do send something out, I like to think it's meaningful and interesting yeah. um, rather than, oh, I went down the field and tipped some muck today. You know? uh, so please do engage. That's all I'll ask. And, um, you know, we thrive on, um, on, on dialogue. So yeah. Uh, yeah. How, do, um, um, how, do, how do people follow you on social media? Uh, so I've got Facebook page, which I think is, you can get it linked through the website, thronefarm.co.uk. Brilliant. I think that's Throne Farm Webley. Cool. And then the Instagram is, uh, you'd have to get that from the website. There's a few videos on YouTube as well. You can get all the links from there, normal way. Yeah. Grant. 
go and check that out listeners thank you very much for listening um please do subscribe to the show on whatever podcast platform you're using and share it on social media if you enjoyed this episode and i am ben eagle this has been meet the farmers and i hope you will have a great week